Welcome back. I'm Alan Hall. I'm Dan Blewett, and this is the Uptime Podcast, where we talk about wind energy, engineering, lightning protection, and ways to keep your wind turbines running. Alan, episode 10 of the Uptime Podcast. How how do you feel about this? Double digits. It's exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Two, two digits. Yeah, we've made it. We're big time now. We got a long way to go to get to, get to three digits. That's the problem. It's a big gap. It's a big, yeah, and then big to get gap. to four digits is like we'll both be dead. We'll both be dead by that point. It's exponential, a long, right? A long time. Yeah. <laughs> we need to get to where we can count it. Well, are we at a? I mean, no, we don't have any exponents yet. We got to get to no. where we have an exponent. Well, ten to the sec, ten to the second. <laughs> yeah, we're ten to the zero. Is that where? No, ten to the zero would be one. Ten to the first. <laughs> Wouldn't ten to the zero be zero? I think ten to the zero is one. Hmm. I could hmm. be wrong. Is I didn't it? major in math, so it's fine. <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> We're good. Yeah. We're good. So, coronavirus week, like, 97. Oh. How's it go- yeah. One-minute recap. <laughs> uh, we're starting to come out of uh, self-isolation. They're they're opening up things this week, which means, I think, next what week. What kind of things? Just, like, Taco Bell or? Oh, Taco Bell. That's, well, that's the critical, that's the critical one. <laughs> Whenever Taco Bell opens up, where it's like safe to slither out of our, our our holes. Let's just let's just be let's let you be known that Taco Bell never closed. They were oh, open really? the whole time. Yes. Well, yeah, they've been there. They've always been essential in all of America's hearts and stomachs. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Taco Bell, for all you do. Thank for you all for staying us. staying open for us. Yes. But the uh, next week is uh, all the barber shops and sort of that kind of nail salons and all those things open up so that's yeah sort of a big milestone i think yeah which i think is fine i mean it's fine I'm, it's I'm a small tiny yeah you have a couple couple people no big deal right well maybe it's a big deal but yet to be seen i guess yeah so i'm, I'm just wondering how they're going to work at all it sounds like it's one person at a time into the place it's that's all fine right yeah I mean, the logistics of a lot of it, just like the empty seats, it just throws in the question, like in an airplane, okay, all, you know, every other seat's empty. How does that affect, I mean, just like, it's all these metrics of how they build the business out and how many seats they have to sell to be profitable. It's just like thrown into chaos. Yeah. And it's the same thing for all the sports venues. I don't know how they're going to deal with this. The amount of money that baseball's losing in any particular game, it's like 600 grand a game. Well, and the baseball thing makes, it just makes... Just like no sense. I mean, I, I get that they're just like making a proposal to, to like make a proposal. Yeah. But the dugout's not 180 feet long. You can't have six foot feet between every player in the dugout. And no. I guess they realize that they're going to have guys like in alternating rows in the stands right behind the dugout. Oh, really? And then it's just like, that's what I heard. Oh. Because I'm sure they realize that. Like you can only fit 10 people in a dugout spaced yeah. out like that. You know, maybe not. So, but it's just like, there just seems like no realistic way that if your pitching coach has COVID-19 that everyone doesn't get it from like hey, how how can like one and that seems to be the purpose of these things is like if, if a person has it we want to make sure no one else gets it but how can your manager have it and then the rest of you not get it how can your first baseman have it and then the rest of you not get it? it just like makes no sense if the trainer no, has there's it there's no way everybody yeah, has there's it. no there's yeah. no way it's no just, way there's just no way but but they can't just they can't just say that and be like oh hey look we're all gonna get it so it's fine. We're not going to have a plan. Like, obviously, they can't do that. No, so they I can't get do it. That. But right. Walmart, yeah. ha- Walmart has a plan. I think the NBA and MLB and NFL can have a plan. Let's. <laughs> I was just... Reasonable. Well, yeah. you Re- said. Reasonable. Well, you sent me that, uh, that ebook the other day talking about the checklist. And mm-hmm. I've, I've been listening to that diligently because it's got like 800 chapters, by the way. And really? Only, yeah. <laughs> I, th- I thought it was a kind of short. I mean, like, I, it only took me like, what, it was like a six hour Six audiobook? hours? Uh, well, it wasn't that long, I don't think. Maybe eight at most. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get one chapter at a time. But what they're talking about is when they had the floods down in, in New Orleans and how uh, large organizations had trouble. But Walmart just said, screw it. We're going to, mm-hmm. we're going to just do the best we can and we're going to let everybody just make decisions on the fly and yeah. see what they could do not a not a bad yeah. way to go about it that was an interesting yeah that was an interesting section so the the book we're referencing is the checklist manifesto by atul gawandi i believe is the doctor's name and uh he wrote this book just uh from his research in how important checklists are to just reducing the casual mishaps that cost hospitals lives and tons and tons of money 
just by forgetting to like one of his examples was um in treating line infections so when you have iv lines like they essentially reduce line infections you know like you know you get an infection in the site of where they put the iv in from like you know, seven, eight, ten percent to effectively zero. Yeah. Just by saying every time you put in a line, you're going to do these five things, like dressings on this part of the body. You're going to wash the skin here. You like go through every one of these five things, and it just had miraculous effects. And they had a lot of really interesting stories. I mean, with the aviation industry, sure, which did. makes to- total sense. But not just like, oh, here's eighty-seven checks you have to do. Right. It was like they they said the the aviation ones were very simple. Because they knew the pilots, like, we're going to memorize a lot of it, but not all of it. Right. I mean, has that been your experience in the industry? Yeah, it, it is. It's when we got into, my wife and I are both engineers, so when we got into engineering, real engineering world, that's one of the first things you realize, because uh, we worked in space. And, and in space, everything's a checklist. Mm-hmm. And so as you come out of school, the first thing you realize, like, everything has a checklist, and you're not going anywhere without having a checklist that someone else has looked at. And then you're going to check off the checklist, and then someone's going to sign off that you check the checklist, and then it's going to go into a file, and someone's going to make sure that the checklist has been filled out, uh, yeah. just so you don't make mistakes. Yeah. But, it, does the chimpanzee have his helmet? Does he have his lunchbox? Does he have, <laughs> you know, all of his stuff to send this little monkey into space? Like, yes. He needs all of his things. It kind of yeah. works. It works just like that, uh, because otherwise you just lose track. And even you know anything in in industry, you see a lot more of it now. When I first got to the aircraft business, and in, even in the winter, wind turbines can be just as bad. Uh, when I first got to those two industries, it was amazing how little checklist things that there were, but they've gradually uh, they've acclimated to the the, the realization that. Having some sort of check off reduces errors. Yeah. Yeah, it does. You know, we forget well, stuff I, or we just haphazardly do stuff and we forget. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I think it was a good book just as a refresher to like say, okay, where do I maybe need to integrate these more into my life? And as I complete projects, making sure I didn't miss, because it's easy to miss just little things. It was yeah. just everyone does it. So, yeah, that's right. So, speaking of, uh, speaking of checklists on our to do list today, leading edge erosion. Mm. So, there's some new tech that we're going to talk about. Yeah. And then, uh, alternating current versus um, high voltage direct current in transporting power from wind turbines to the grid. So let's yep. start with leading edge erosion. So uh, new article off the web today, or not not today, but this week about nickel cobalt tiles. So this technology has been around for a little while, but they're just now trying to apply this to to wind turbines, right? Right. It's something we've used on airplanes for a long time, or something very similar. Anytime you have any rotating device or any time you're going to be impacting a lot of ice, mostly ice crystals or water particles, on a structure that you care about, on a, a propeller, wing, uh, on an airplane, uh, they're going to use some, some something pretty robust, uh, particularly propellers. So propellers, most propellers have a, a, a nickel leading edge, and helicopter blades tend to be something very similar. Propellers not as robust as helicopters that way, but propellers have this nickel leading edge, and what it's there for is to stop erosion of the of the blade. And it looks like ORE catapult, which is offshore renewable energy catapult, which is based in the United Kingdom, has been doing uh, some rain erosion testing comparisons of different kinds of rain erosion methodologies, the techniques, materials, the whole thing, uh, because they have a lot of wind turbines offshore obviously, and uh, they're trying to find a good solution. So they've been publishing some papers recently on nickel cobalt. And when it kind of looks like, Dan, didn't you think it was looked like shingles in a sense, or like these little sections that are kind of glued onto the blade? Yeah, it looks like, I mean, they call it, they refer to them as tiles. So tiles. yeah, it, it seems to be that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's a bunch of tiles that get kind of glued on. And I, I'm sure that they've done a lot of testing. So the testing indicated they had done... 85 hours in a rain erosion test facility uh, at a higher speed and it did well versus yep. uh like you know 15 hours at a lower speed so they said that there's definitely some erosion benefit yeah well the faster you go right it's one half i'm gonna throw you i'm gonna throw you an energy equation one half mass and oh, yeah, velocity squared there you go. so as you go up in velocity mm-hmm. it actually squares the energy so going up a couple of miles an hour actually does a lot more damage so you double the velocity, you quadruple the energy of each impact. That adds up. So it doesn't take long to really increase the energy. So going to a higher speed obviously is a lot more conservative. The- so why that that specific material? Like you don't hear about nickel 
at least in the consumer market, obviously yeah. like the, the commercial market you hear, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of different technologies, but in the, in the consumer market, you hear of things made of copper when mm -hmm. they need to be durable and, and resistant. You think of stainless steel, yep. like what, what's the deal with nickel cobalt? It's hard. It's really, really hard. Uh, that's, and it doesn't, it takes a lot of abuse before it starts to give way. It's just a really hard, durable material. And what I mean hard, it's got pluses and minuses. When you deal with hard materials, it's, it's hard, it's very difficult to form them into any particular plus, shape. Plus ductile, ductile, yeah, ductility. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're high resistance. Middle school. Yeah, so they're, they're a high resistance material electrically. Uh, they can be kind of on the brittle scale, more mm -hmm. towards brittle than flexible, like copper is very pliable. Uh, yeah. Nickel doesn't tend to be that way. But that's why they coat things in nickel a lot of times uh, on aircraft parts, the things that are outside, like uh, around the landing gear and that kind of thing. They can get nickel plating plating on them because it's a very so hard material. Yes, yeah, so they form it with a more malleable material and then just plate it with nickel. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Yep. Yep. So that, gotcha. that's that's the same kind of thought here. Now, the, the cobalt part of the nickel cobalt, uh, I thought was interesting because I thought we were trying to get away from using cobalt so much. It's a little, yeah, it's a little controversial. People are getting killed over it and it's still yeah. a conflict mineral, right? Yeah, it, it is in some places. So that's why they're trying to get rid of it in batteries. Yeah. It's got a great color though. Cobalt, just a superb blue, bluish color, right? Yeah, I guess it's cobalt blue is a cool color, but it's a really good color. <laughs> is it worth dying over? Not <laughs> worth di not worth dying over, but I just it's a great, no. it's a great yeah. color for an element. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they use these, use these on airplane propellers. So why is it been why is it taking so long for them to put something metallic on the edge of a wind turbine blade? I mean, wind turbines have been around for twenty plus years. Mm. Like why is why is this a new idea now? I don't know if necessarily it's a new idea. It's it's more of how desperate do you have to be before you <laughs> before you get to some solution like that? Because you want to try everything yeah. else. You're trying to you're trying to do it less in a less expensive, more manufacturing friendly. Uh, design than nickel cobalt would be so putting on tiles is I'm sure it's gonna be labor-intensive and I'm sure it's gonna be expensive and I'm sure it's gonna run into problems uh, versus just spraying on a more durable coating if those are your two choices you're gonna to go to spray on coating versus gluing things something on that, yeah. that's 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 what's happened and so until until the spray on coatings show that they don't last as long as in theory as they were predicted to last you don't get to the next stage it's just like anything else right you, you try it you see what it works if it doesn't work well enough then you go to something that's more extreme that's yeah what so done. let's back up so so what is what is the typical leading edge um composed of also off the factory floor uh it depends on who's manuf manufacturing it was just talk very generic and simple terms it's basically yeah, just that's a, what i want it's that's what a, i want it's this it's basically the same kind of coating that they make the blade out of it's going to be some sort of resin system with uh, uh, with a painted coating on it. Sometimes they'll add uh, another pliable coating to it. The ones you see out in the repair world where they've gone out and repaired blades, on the leading edge of blades, it, it tends to be kind of a, a coating that they rolled on with a roller. Uh, so it's just another sort of thickened paint or polyurethane-ish kind of thing. I've, I, in, I think, uh, was it Polytech and, and or Siemens Gamesa? We're doing something similar last summer where they were putting on just basically these polyurethane erosion materials. It's kind of a real thick plastic, rubbery plastic. It's used on airplanes all the time. And they were applying okay. it to the wind turbines just to absorb the, the rain blows. Yeah, that, that's, that's you know, from the, just the, the simplest forms, that's kind of what you see. Either some sort of spray-on, rub-on coating or polyurethane sheet that's applied to the... To yeah. the leading edge, yeah, simple. So, so is putting metal on the edge of these turbine blades is that going to be a, a lightning nightmare or what? Yeah. <laughs> so just just sum it up, just nightmare. It, it's uh, going to be fun. You got two problems: you got static charge buildup, and then you have the lightning issue. So it's a piece of metal hanging on on a blade. Yeah, it's going to attract lightning. And how are you going to ground all these tiles? I don't know. You're going to have to figure out some way to do that. And it isn't like you can connect to nickel very easily. That's one of the problems with nickel is that nothing really sticks to it. That's why you use it, so, because things don't stick to it. So uh, what, do you mean, what do you mean stick? Adhesive. Adhesive or solder or bolt things up oh. to it. It's just not a material. It's kind of like gold that way. Like It's a metal that doesn't like to bond to anything else without going to extreme efforts. Um, 
so that that's that's the problem and then each of these if you if you if you think of them as individual tiles you got these electrically isolated pieces of metal impacting ice and rain all the time they're going to build up charge and they're going to start sparking there's you can, there's only so much charge that thing will hold before it'll start to spark over and try to find a ground pass somewhere so they got to figure out that problem too so and may have figured out the erosion problem it's the same thing we had a we had the same problem on airplane propellers for years you know you put this leading edge on and it stops all, all the mechanical erosion and the problem is you start building up the static charge and the propeller blades sparking over everything <laughs> sparking over everywhere making all kinds of electrical noise which you don't want and creating these big discharges to places you don't want they're gonna have the same problem yeah, that doesn't sound that doesn't sound great yeah no so do you, I mean, is there an opportunity here? So, all right, you've got this, you know, long strip of cobalt tiles on the edge. Can you then link that to something like a segment of lightning diverter, like strike tape? Can you, like, integrate this in? Like, does this have to suddenly, I assume it probably has to become part of the entire lightning, you know, to it ground would. Ecos- ecosystem, right? Yeah, it would. How are they going to connect it? I don't know. I mean, having dealt with that on an aircraft for a number of years, it's no fun. Making connections to those leading edges is no fun. A lot of times on a propeller, it's very sacrificial. If you if the propeller were to take a strike on an aircraft, it's just got to survive long enough to get you back on the ground because you're going to take the propeller off and put a new one on. You really can't do that on the wind turbine side. So you want to be able to take yeah. strikes on these tiles and not have to go replace them all the time. Because the reason you're putting those tiles on is most likely is because the wind turbine's out in the ocean somewhere and you don't want to go out to the ocean and fix it. You want to put these tiles on and leave it. But it's not just rain erosion you have to deal with. It's everything else that goes along with it. You're in an extreme environment. Lightning is one of those things. Static electricity is another one of those issues you're going to have to find a solution for. And this is where all the compromises come in, and that's where engineers have to make really hard decisions. Hey, look, we're going to have to live with this negative impact to get this positive outcome. That's where the, you know, the... The staplers start flying in the conference rooms just because everybody has their opinion. I, I think there's going to have to be some sort of compromise here, and they better start looking at the lightning protection side of it. I'm sure somebody's thought of it. It's a question of what they've done about it. Yeah, I mean, are there other materials that are, I mean, like you think of ceramics that are less conductive, obviously? Like, I yeah. mean, are they a candidate this, for this? I mean, I think there's ceramic coatings and all sorts of stuff. That, yeah, you kind of get into I mean, hardness, brittle versus flexible, too soft. Plus the fact that you're rotating so fast. The the problem with the polyurethane sheets that you bond on to wind turbine blades, as the speeds go up, there's an, there's a force trying to rip that sheet off the blade. They just go faster and faster and faster. You think about the mm-hmm. G-force, sort of the G-forces associated with that. It starts to peel things off. There's all kinds of problems that you have to think about here. I don't, I, I don't know. We'll see how it plays out. I, I One of the... When I read the article, I was like, oh, this is cool. Then I read the article a little more, and I'm like, oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> it just sounds like it could be problematic. It just, you know, like you said, it opens up another can of worms that then has to be sort of solved for. Yeah. There's no perfect solution to any of this. You're going to have to suffer somewhere. You guess you've got to figure out where. You, know, you, may, you may be able to live with a little bit of leading edge erosion to fix the lightning issue, maybe. Yeah. What, what other materials could you use there? Uh... It is not a lot Tort- to choose tortoise, from. Tortoise shell. Whoa. We gotta go natural. We gotta go natural. Renewable <laughs> turtles are a renewable resource. <laughs> we just develop a huge turtle farm to get enough shells, um, and then what am I saying? I love turtles. I don't want to do that. But yeah. if we had synthetic turtle shells, <laughs> synthetic turtles. then we could put them on the 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 blades. So you need someone outside the box to, to solve these problems. Well, there you, you go. Guys are, you guys are too close. You're too close to the issue. <laughs> um, well, how how thick do these tiles have to be to not just like melt? Because they're I mean the current's going to go in and through them. They're not going to make like that ionized channel like uh, no. a segmented lightning diverter. So right. how how thick do they have to be to not pretty thick be decimated? Pretty thick. Yeah. So the nickel cobalt has a pretty high melting temperature. But it also gets hot really fast because it's pretty resistive. So if you shove 200,000 amps into a tile, it's going to get hot fast. Now, some part of it's going to go past its melting temperature probably, and you're probably going to melt a hole in it. That's most likely what's going to happen. The other part about when you get something that hot uh, in a tile form is that locally where it gets hot, it wants to expand, and so it wants to pull it's itself gonna away. Push those, it's going to make a gap and then... Yeah, it wants hmm. to bubble. Think of it think of it like bubbling up. It's sort of like that. It wants to bubble up and swell up and get a, and 
because it's so hot, you're talking about more than a yeah. thousand degrees Celsius, more than likely, it's going to get really hot, and all the structure underneath it's going to get really hot, which is another problem because you don't want to damage the wind turbine structure underneath of it, but you're probably going to do that because if you stick on this piece of high-resistance metal and you shove 200,000 amps into it, whatever's underneath it's going to get really hot really fast. Um, again, you know, this is this is that engineering trade-off when I say t staplers flying across the room. I, I literally yeah. mean staplers flying because everybody has gets so wrapped up in their own particular solution that they're willing to, to go to physical battle to defend it it's it's a weird engineering thing because everybody well because they're all working so dang hard on this thing yeah. you know and then someone just so comes like in throwing you throw in your colander and you've got like your yeah, soup spoon as your yeah, weapon and yeah, you like yeah, slide yeah. across in a in a desk chair and you're like <laughs> jousting with whatever you can find that it, sounds awesome it's uh engineering meetings can be very contentious that way and because it's everybody's at when you get to a situation like this everybody's at full stress mode typically because you're trying to fix a problem that is big and it has a lot of visibility and there is a there's one part you can be credited for the win you know like hey we came up with a solution that solved the world's problems that's cool mm -hmm. so you want to defend that on the other hand the closer you get to solving the world's problems the more vulnerable you are because there's so many more people poking at you about it so you have to be able to just kind of ignore the noise, but also make sure you've done your homework and gotcha. and take those. Uh, the, the hard part about all of this, because it happens in airplanes all the time, is to swallow your pride, listen to whatever everybody's saying and try to incorporate their ideas into this concept. Because it's just like I was having this discussion about Thomas Edison and the light bulb. So Thomas Edison didn't invite and just invent the light bulb by himself. Can we all get over that? Uh, I know it simplifies history quite a bit, but there's really yeah. very few inventions that are made by themselves or in a vacuum. Uh, there, it's usually done by some sort of group or or a consortium of different people going after the same goal, and that's how we find ultimately a good solution. And that's going to exist here. It just takes. It's just going to take time to settle it out. So even though you're just going to see a lot of articles and stuff popping out about a way they've, in theory, solved a problem, you know, this is the time where they're going to get poked back, and we'll see how they respond to it. Yeah, well, you wonder if it, uh, if it becomes a candidate for something like, you know, Elon Musk, where he's released a lot of his patents. Yeah. Just so that the car industry, electric car industry, grows. Everyone can, everyone can grow. Right. You wonder if it ends up being something like that. It you could know, for all the all the kooky things and yep. counterproductive things he seems to to do in the media. Um, he does have obviously a lot of good ideas. That seems like one of them to push his industry farther. Well, so. there, I, I, let's let's oh, let's throw Elon Musk into the Thomas Edison bucket. Elon Musk isn't coming up with all those ideas. Like, come on, right? He's got a bunch of smart people that surround him too. You know, mm -hmm. they focus the energy on him. He he he's the one that's willing to take the blows in the media. Uh, to keep his other engineers and scientists away from the controversy. He's not yeah. coming up with all these things. Yeah, that's fair. So let's shift gears. So the other sort of long-term problem solution is getting uh, the energy collected by wind turbines into the power grid. So yeah. still today, it's alternating current is the way pretty much all of them send their power. But now they're, there's more uh, press releases and articles about the potential to switch over to direct current. So you as an electrical guy, how do uh, how do you how do you find that? How does that sit with you? So you you go to engineering specifically electrical engineering school and the first thing they tell you is hey, in order to transmit a lot of power, you need to cut down the amount of current because you're going to shove it through a wire. A wire is resistive. So the power loss in the wire is related to how much current you're shoving through it. So it's I squared R is the current runs to the wire that amount of power is dropped in the wire the resistance of the wire times the current squared there it is there it is uh the the problem is and the way you solve that is you raise the voltage up really really high so if you raise the voltage up really really high and you drop the current really low there's less power dropped in the wire okay that's that's, that's what you're taught in electrical engineering school mm -hmm. the problem and and so the problem with doing it dc wise is you can't really get from I don't know, pick a, pick a volt, 12 volts. You can't get from 12 volts to like... No, no, 13 volts. 13 I don't volts, 12 volts. 13 volts Thank to, you. to 30, 
2,000 volts roughly, it's hard to get there without having some sort of electronic device to, to lift the voltage up that high so you can transmit it. Mm-hmm. That's that's a trouble. So what, uh, because you can you can transform AC voltages and currents easily with a transformer. That's what Tesla invented way back with Westinghouse way back when. Uh, gotcha. It's hard to transform DC into anything because it takes electron. It essentially takes electronics, and so until recently, in the last couple of years, we haven't been able to get to really high voltage enough where he could shove energy very far. But there may be an advantage to tr- to transmitting some energy via DC, particularly over shorter ranges. Probably it's where they're going. Um, it may take less copper to do it. But it also may have an advantage of making the, the cable itself less expensive, depending on how they set up. One of the issues with, the, with, with uh, alternating current, because it's alternating, you get this sort of uh, these magnetic fields that are set up, and you're, you're creating and destroying these magnetic fields all the time. So you have this, quote unquote, reactive power thing going on. So you, there's some losses in reactive power that you don't necessarily have in DC. Uh, that's sort of the trade-off. So if you're really trying to get super, super, super efficient on transmitting power from A to B, it may be easier to do with high voltage DC if you can get the electronics and the electronics are reliable enough to do it. That may be the best, most efficient way to do it. Hmm. Okay. So I mean, as these get farther and farther offshore, you know, into the hundred kilometers offshore kind of range, you still think it's AC or DC probably that far out? If they can make electronics work, it's going to be DC. If they can make electronics work, that's going to be... Because, you know, think about any time you throw another piece of electronic equipment in the middle of a something you really need. Uh, mm-hmm. Putting a po- coil of copper wire in a bucket of oil, which is essentially what a transformer is, doesn't have any moving parts. There's no electronics. There's no transistors involved with that process. As soon as you shove something electronic into this pathway, you have faults and failure modes that you just really don't have with high voltage transformers. So on the on the on the HV DC trail, tell me real quick how it gets from wind turbine into into my home to power this microphone. Like, uh, where, like where does it go? Like what? So people talk about a power grid. Mm-hmm. Um, like just tell me the, the journey of this elect- electricity to get to the power grid to get here. So it depends how the generator set up, but without getting too into too much depth in how genera- how power is generated. At some point at the wind turbine, um, it's gonna get converted to, typically it's gonna get converted, it's in some sort of AC form, and there's transformers that raise the voltage up so you can transmit it down the line until you get to a substation, and there's some, there's capacitors you have to put on the line. There's, there's a bunch of reactive, capacitance issues you're trying to deal with to get everything into phase so you're trying to one of the things you don't want to do is connect up to the grid ac power wise and be out of phase it causes a lot of problems and the power company will dump you off the circuit when they when they sense that happening uh, so from the wind turbine company's perspective you want to be in sync with the power company so you you got all these wind turbines that are all generating power. They're coming to some sort of substation, and then they're connecting, syncing up with the substation. And and once the power company thinks you're cool and everything is right, they're going to hook you up to the grid, and you're going to be part of the grid. And if you ever get off that, they just dump you, which is a problem. So what they're talking about now is you're sort of converting to DC DC at the sort of quasi the base of the wind turbine. You're transmitting down to down to somewhere near the substation. You're converting that from DC to AC there. You're syncing up right there. It gets rid of a lot of uh, line issues, uh, capacitance issues you have to deal with, reactive issues you have to deal with as far as transmission line stuff. That's what they're talking about. So once you get to the grid, then you're pulling off, you, Dan, is pulling off the grid. You never see all the stuff that's happening behind the scenes back here. Uh, that's mm-hmm. that's invisible to you because you've got this cascade of of power companies and engineers and technicians making sure that your lights don't flicker. That's how they're doing it. Is they're they're constantly monitoring that grid. So um, that's one of the issues with wind turbines and solar. The same way, which is you got to make sure you're delivering the, the quality product. It'd be like a, at a gas station, right? So 
I have a tank full of gasoline. I can't I can't have the wrong wrong octane or, or the wrong mixture in a, in a tank where it has the right mm-hmm. mixture in it. It's the same sort of thing. Like I I want to make sure I'm delivering the right product at the right time so my customer's happy. It kind of works like that. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, well, we're going to wrap up today's episode of Uptime. If you're new to the show, welcome. If you're a regular here, thank you for your continued support. Please subscribe to the show and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to check out the WeatherGuard Lightning Tech YouTube channel for video episodes, full interviews, and short clips from each show. For Alan and all of us at WeatherGuard, stay safe, and we'll see you next week. Is downtime causing you financial pain and putting a stop to your power production for months on end? It's no secret, lightning strike damage is a major cause of wind turbine downtime. This damage is preventable with our easy to install strike tape lightning protection system for wind turbine blades. Our incredible engineering, build quality, materials, and edge sealants withstand up to five times more abuse in the toughest weather and lightning conditions. And we've got the research to prove it. If you're tired of constant downtime, we can help. Reach out to us at weatherguardwind.com and schedule a free call. We'll get your uptime back in no time.